So we're starting at verse 18 of Matthew chapter 8. When Jesus saw the crowd around him, he gave orders to cross to the other side of the lake. Then a teacher of the law came to him and said, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Another disciple said to him, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus told him, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. <laughs> Thank you, Jilly. Uh, it's great to see you all this morning. Um, if I haven't met you before, my name is James. Everyone calls me G. Two people have already asked me this morning. Should I call you James or G? Everyone calls me G, but it's my silly nickname. So um, uh, that's me. And uh, I normally go to the church in the, uh, the afternoon, the service in the afternoon, but it's my privilege to be with you this morning uh, to be able to preach on this passage. And it's a short passage, which, which could mean it would be a short sermon. Who knows? Uh, I know, and I'm not going to tell you. Uh, but it's a curious passage, isn't it? It's a curious passage. Did you, did you notice that as we read through? Uh, and it's also a challenging passage. Uh, and so, as ever, we need the Lord's help. Uh, so let's pray together as we start and ask for him to help. Lord, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for this opportunity to focus on his words and his actions and to think about what it means to be his follower. Give us open ears, we, we pray, and uh, soft hearts. And by your spirit, please speak to each one of us this morning in just the way we need so that we might leave here loving Jesus more and committed to following him wherever that may lead. And we ask that in his precious name. Amen. Amen. So we're thinking this morning about uh, evaluating cost and assessing worth. Uh, we do it all the time, don't we? So I'm, I'm an Aldi shopper. It's out there. I've seen some of you in there as well, so I know you are. And in, the, in Aldi, they have the middle aisles, don't they? And, and you get a weird and wonderful selection of stuff. And as I'm pushing my trolley along, I feel strangely drawn to a fire pit that I never realized I needed or an electric foot warmer. And I think, oh, that looks good. Um, but then the question comes, how much is it? And you look at the price and you, you think, mm, maybe I don't need a fire pit right now. Or, or maybe the foot warmer is you know, a little bit too expensive. We need to know how much something costs before we can decide whether it's worth it, don't we? We don't just do it with, with money, we do it, let's say you're going on the, the New, Year's, New Year's Day walk with, with Bill, and um, you think that sounds nice, but you need to know really how far is it gonna be to check whether you can get around. If Bill says it, it's sort of 28 miles, which he might know Bill, um, then uh, you might think, I'm not sure I'm gonna make it. But you need to know before you set off how far it's gonna be and whether you're gonna be able to do it. We need to know at the cost of things, and we're used to making that calculation all the time in everyday life in, in every different way. And uh, actually, we ask that same question about following Jesus. Uh, we ask that same question. So we run a course here at Grace Church called Hope Explored, and there's another course called Christianity Explored, and both of them use the same structure in the course uh, of identity, mission, and call. And so the way it works is that identity, you think about who is Jesus, his identity. And then you think about his mission. Why did he come? And then the third thing that's very important is the call. What does it mean to follow him? What is the cost of following Jesus? And that structure flows out of the Gospels, uh, including Matthew. And in these uh, verses that we've been looking at in these um, chapters, we can see everywhere identity, mission, and call. So, so if, let's think about identity. Um, look, at, look back at Matthew 7, 28, just um, the end of the previous chapter. Everybody's talking about who is Jesus. It says the crowds were amazed at his teaching. Why? Because he taught as one who had authority <laughs> and not as their teachers of the law. His teaching 
his wisdom is on a different level to anything they've ever heard before. And then last week, Tim preached on the first part of Matthew 8, and we saw his power to heal. He healed a leper just by touching him. He healed a centurion's servant just by speaking. He healed Peter's mother-in-law so quickly that she immediately got up and started serving him. Who has power like that? Who can do that? And the next passage after this one shows his power over nature. He calms a furious storm that is so ferocious it's about to sink the disciples' boat. And he stands up with a single command, be still. The wind and the waves go completely flat. And in verse 27 of Matthew 8, it says the men were amazed and they asked, what kind of man is this? That's right, isn't it? That's the question. What kind of man is this? Jesus is showing them that he's the son of God, the Messiah, the Lord. He's showing them his identity. But what about his mission? Why did he come? Now, did you notice at the beginning of our chapter today, it says, when Jesus saw the crowd around him, he gave orders to cross to the other side of the lake to get away from the crowds. Why? If, if that was me, I would say, wow, this is fantastic. Look at all these people. They love me. This is working. I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing. Build the crowd, work the crowd. But not Jesus. Not Jesus, because he had a mission that was much, much bigger than simply impressing the crowds around Galilee with his teaching and his miracles, amazing as they were. He came to preach repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And not only that, but then to be the means by which that forgiveness was possible, by dying in our place on the cross. That's why he came. He came to die for our sins. That was his mission. And if we don't understand that, or we don't appreciate that, or we forget that, then we'll relate to Jesus in totally the wrong way, or more likely, ignore him altogether. So we need to be clear about his identity. We need to be clear about his mission. And that brings us to his call. What does it mean to follow Jesus? Or as the header of our passage puts it today, the cost of following Jesus. And we meet two men in the passage who are both essentially asking that same question in different ways. But they're asking, is it worth it? Is it worth it? Is he worth it? Is following Jesus worth it? They're weighing up that cost. Uh, and that's the same question for us too, uh, whether we're not yet believers, whether we are believers. Every day we're asking that question. Uh, today, am I going to put Jesus first? So there's something here for us all to listen to and all to think about. So when we meet the first man in verse 19, uh, have a look down with me. It says he's a teacher of the law. And uh, by the way, this is the first time in Matthew's account that an influential person, a man of status, has come to Jesus. He would be a good guy to have on the team, don't you think? A teacher of the law, very well respected. Uh, and he makes this wonderful statement to Jesus. I will follow you wherever you go. It seems sincere uh, and genuine. And you might think that Jesus would say, excellent, thank you, brilliant, great to have you on the team. But what he actually says in verse 20 is totally unexpected. He says, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. It's unexpected. And, and it's not exactly encouraging, is it? Uh, it almost seems like he's trying to put him off. And usually it's the other way around, isn't it? So charismatic leaders of great movements are much more likely to promise amazing things if you follow them, you know, to change your life for the better or to change the world together. Follow me, they say, this is going to be awesome. You won't regret it. But not Jesus. It's as if he's saying, are you sure? Have you really thought this through? I'm not going to be staying in palaces or fancy hotels. I'm not going to be making lots of money and, and buying a big house somewhere. I'm not going to be sitting in the places of honour in the temple. I'm going to be on the road, going from place to place to place. And it's going to be tough. In fact, even foxes and birds of the air are going to be better off than me. And you really think you're going to follow me wherever I go? Really? 
You see, at this stage, uh, this man and all of the other would-be disciples have no real idea of what following Jesus is going to be like. They're hearing the teaching, they're seeing the miracles, they're experiencing the crowds. And uh, you can imagine them being swept along on a kind of wave of excitement. It must have been awesome, mustn't it? But Jesus doesn't want to use mass psychology, whipping the crowd up into a frenzy so they all decide to jump onto the bandwagon together. And he doesn't want to pull the wool over anyone's eyes. He wants to be honest. Following him will not be easy, and it will not be what they're expecting. There will be no fame and fortune and popularity, but rather persecution and hardship, harassment and disrespect, criticism and physical danger. And he's upfront with them about that. And more than that, he's going to teach them that if they follow him, they must deny themselves and take up their cross. That comes in a few chapters time. What does that, what does that mean? Well, I think at its heart, it means living out the two greatest commandments, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength, and to love your neighbour as yourself. So rather than putting yourself first and doing everything you can for a comfortable life, an easy life, you put Jesus first. You live for him, you serve him, you're not ashamed of him, and you follow him in serving others, putting them above yourself. And I'd be willing to bet that's not what this disciple had in mind when he said, I will follow you wherever you go. And fair enough, he hadn't been taught it yet, but that's why Jesus is being honest with him. And the danger for people then, and the danger for people now, is that if we underestimate the cost of following Jesus, we will start enthusiastically. But when things get harder than we expected, we'll drop out. That's why in Christianity Explored, Rico Tice insists on talking about the call of Jesus, not just who he is, not just why he came, which we need, but also what it means to follow him. But it does beg the question, doesn't it? Why would then anybody follow Jesus? It sounds terrible. <laughs> why would you do it and that's why we, we mustn't underestimate the cost of following Jesus but we mustn't underestimate the blessing of following Jesus either uh, Rico puts it like this whatever is given up is nothing compared to what is gained whatever is given up is nothing compared to what is gained there is so much we could say here isn't there and I, in a way I'd love to stop and I'd just love to like crowdsource all the great things there are about being a Christian. But let me rattle through a few because uh, we haven't got time. Peace with God and with each other. Purpose in your life. Forgiveness for your sins. Proper forgiveness. Community. People who love you for who you are. Assurance. Self-esteem. Comfort. Freedom. Hope for the future. Hope in the face of death. In the upside down kingdom of Jesus, which we saw uh, on the Gospel Project last week, it, it turns out that loving God and loving others is actually the path to our own contentment and joy and peace. It's, it's a win, win, win. It's brilliant. And it's the best way to live because we live with Jesus. We're adopted as children of God. We receive the spirit of God to help us. And we follow the son of God. We don't follow him to get more money and a bigger house and a nicer car. But as we follow Jesus, we store up <laughs> treasure in heaven. We don't follow Jesus to impress people and be popular. Far from it. But as we follow Jesus, we gain brothers and sisters in Christ who will be with us for eternity. We don't follow Jesus for help with passing exams or moving up career ladder but as we follow Jesus we have the assurance that whether we pass or fail <clears throat> he has a plan and a purpose for our life we don't follow Jesus as some sort of cosmic health insurance to avoid getting sick but as we follow him we know that our suffering will never be pointless and that there will be an end to it and we have a future uh, hope that is free from pain and sickness and death. So yes, 
there's a cost to following Jesus. And we need to know that before we start. But whatever is given up is nothing compared to what is gained. So let's not underestimate the cost of following Jesus, but let's not underestimate the blessing either. And let's remind each other of those blessings as we talk let's do it today after the service. What about the second guy, verse 21? An even more curious response. He, he's described as a disciple, uh, which is good. So I think it's a good thing. And he starts his apparently reasonable request with the word Lord, which I think is a good start too. It's a sign of respect uh, and commitment. And he says, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But again, Jesus' answer is not, it's, it's not just not encouraging. It seems positively harsh. What do you think? Jesus told him, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. What is going on here? Does, does Jesus lack empathy? Uh, does he lack compassion? Is, is he unfeeling? Well, we, we know that's not the case. We see in countless examples, Jesus encountering people who've lost loved ones, who are bereaved, and he weeps with them. He's incredibly compassionate towards them. What, what, what's the difference with this guy? We know that Jesus perfectly fulfilled the Ten Commandments, number five of which is honour your father and mother. And he's saying, don't bother burying your father. It doesn't, it doesn't stack up, does it? And I've learned over the years that whenever I come across a passage where Jesus or God the Father appears to be being unreasonable or, or harsh or, or, in my view, just wrong, I haven't understood it properly. I need to do some more work, some more digging, and then things fall into place. As I was thinking about this, this guy, so he's out in the crowd following Jesus, okay? Um, it must have taken him time to walk out there. He didn't, didn't get a bus out there. Uh, so I don't think his, and he hasn't got a mobile phone. So his father hasn't just died because there's no way they could have told him while he was out on the mountainside with Jesus. And if he died before he left, surely he wouldn't have gone to listen to Jesus. He would have waited and done the funeral and then gone to see Jesus. So I agree with the commentators who say his father hasn't died yet. His father's still alive and he's saying, let me stay with my father until he dies, and then I will follow you. Can you see how you can read it that way? First, let me bury my father. He's not dead yet, but please let me just wait until that time in the future. I have no idea when it would be. Then I'll bury him. Then I'll come and follow you. Maybe even, then I'll bury him. Then I'll get my inheritance. I'll be financially <clears throat> secure. Then I'll come and follow you. That puts a different light on it, doesn't it? That puts a different light on it. And it makes sense of Jesus's response. Jesus is suggesting the spiritually dead should bury the physically dead and that this disciple should just get on with, with following him. Um, and I think that Jesus is calling out, this is a question of his priority. He's saying, he's saying this disciple is making excuses. He's not putting Jesus first. That's the issue. And that's not OK. So if the last guy was an underestimator, this guy is the procrastinator. And at the heart of his procrastinating is that something else is more important than Jesus. He's saying, I acknowledge you as Lord. I want to follow you. But there's just something else I want to do first. Something that honestly, at the moment, I think is more important. That's worth more to me than following you. Now, remember, Jesus is never unreasonable. He loves us. He doesn't call us to ab abandon our families in their time of need. Quite the opposite. He calls us to serve others, putting their needs above our own, to forgive others just as we've been forgiven, to love our neighbour as ourselves. And when we do that, we will be a better son or daughter, friend, employee, student, neighbour, citizen, than we would have been otherwise. But if loving them comes between us and Jesus, then we must choose Jesus. We must put him first. And then we can love others as we should. So Jesus is worth putting first. He's worth it. And this guy is making excuses. And in that sense, he's a warning for us because we all have that same temptation. Maybe you're here today and uh, you're not yet a Christian. It's brilliant that you're here. 
Um, it's, it's brilliant you're thinking it through. It might be that you haven't yet heard enough about who Jesus is and why he came to decide whether it's worth following him. Maybe that's what you need to do. You need to find out more about Jesus. You should do the Hope Explore course. You should do the Christianity Explore course. Every time I do that course, uh, leading it through, uh, my own faith is encouraged. And I've seen so many people come to faith and say they've understood the gospel going through those courses. So we announce them on a regular basis. And this is my personal commendation and urge to get you to do it. Um, and that's, there you go. I'll, Come and ask me more later if you want to hear more about it. But it may be that you know enough about his identity and his mission. And you're thinking about the cost. You're counting the cost of what it means to follow, uh, follow Jesus. And you're just not sure about committing it. You, you want to live a little first. Um, you don't want to be bound right now by putting Jesus first and living the way he tells you to do. Um, maybe you're thinking, I'm sure I will want to at some point. I think this is a common thing when we're younger. You think, you know, I'll be a Christian later. I've, I've just got a few things that I want to do first. I want to have a bit of a good time. I want to live life my own way. And then I'll come to Jesus later on. But that, that's to misunderstand how great it is to live with Jesus as your Lord and your Savior. How disappointing your life will be without him. And to misunderstand that Jesus is not okay with that. Jesus is calling you to follow him now. And I, you know, by the way, I've never met a Christian who became a Christian in later life who said, I'm so glad that I had all that time to do selfish things. And, you know, kind of, they, they always say, I wish I'd become a Christian sooner. I'm looking at Jason. I remember your baptism uh, statement. You should ask Jason later on. It was very powerful. He I won't, I won't paraphrase it, but talk to Jason. It's brilliant. And, but for those of us who are um, Christians here today, there's a challenge for us too. Because Jesus is saying, I want to be first in your heart in every area of your life. So take money, for example. Uh, the Bible calls us to give sacrificially to gospel work. And to state the obvious, that means giving in a way that is a sacrifice that you notice not just the, the kind of small change that you have uh, when you bought everything else. Uh, and that means not doing things or not buying things that you would otherwise have spent the money on. But what if you're a disciple who says, look, I, I hear that, I totally agree with that, but first let me just you know, pay off the mortgage or get this kind of dream holiday out of the way that we've been planning or upgrade the car or, or whatever it is. What about time? Uh, Jesus wants us to serve. And we say, yeah, I hear you. I'm definitely up for that. But, you know, I've just got a lot of stuff going on at the moment. Uh, I'm busy. Uh, I need a bit of downtime. Uh, I've got a hobby that I'm really into. I need to, I need to relax. Whatever, whatever it is. You know when you're making an excuse and when it's genuine, don't you? Well, it's the same issue as the first guy, ultimately. It's counting the cost of following Jesus. Are we prepared to put him first? Is he worth it? Uh, our last song today, which I'm, I hope I have time to sing, is Be Thou My Vision. Uh, and verse three contains these words. Riches I heed not, nor man's empty praise. Thou, Jesus, mine inheritance, now and always. Thou and thou only. The first in my heart, high king of heaven, my treasure thou art. That's the commitment that Jesus requires of each one of us. Not putting off following him and remembering that whatever is given up is nothing compared to what is gained. So what does it mean to follow Jesus? Well, well it means not underestimating the cost, uh, knowing that, there, that we need to pick up our cross and follow him. But it also means not, not underestimating the blessing, the joy that it is to live with Jesus as our king. And it means being clear that Jesus comes first above everything and everyone else. Perhaps uh, there's a relationship, there's someone who would pull you away from Jesus. Uh, perhaps we need to put Jesus above a career move, if a job that would demand your it would be a job that would demand your total commitment to the expense of everything else, including your faith. 
uh, we, we put Jesus above popularity. If being faithful to him would be seen as uncool or unacceptable. We put Jesus above wealth. If giving sacrificially or, or behaving with integrity in your business makes you poorer than you would otherwise be. There will be sacrifices, but it's so, so worth it. So if we're here today, we're not yet Christians. Maybe we, we, we are Christians. We haven't been baptized yet. Um, some of our teenagers are in that situation. We need to uh, consider the call of Jesus, whether we're ready to take that step to publicly declare that we want to follow him. If that's you, please chat to me, chat to Tim, chat to Martin. Afterwards, we'd love to talk to you about that. For those of us who are followers of Jesus, we need to remember that, that no Christian is immune to the temptation to put other things before God. The Bible warns us about it constantly. And in that moment where something else, someone else, seems more attractive than Jesus, let's remember who Jesus is, our precious Lord and Saviour. Why he came to die on a cross to save us from our sins and what it means to follow him, picking up our cross daily and making him first in our heart. And, you know, in his kindness, because he knows it's tough, he's given us his spirit to help us do that. He doesn't just give us an impossible task and kind of watch us fail. He's given us his spirit. So I'm going to finish with some more words that we're also about to sing. Um, that I'm hoping we can pray and, and make our own. With every breath, I long to follow Jesus. For he has said that he will bring me home. And day by day, I know he will renew me until I stand with joy before the throne. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. All the glory evermore to him. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. Let's pray together. <coughs> Lord Jesus, thank you that you never trick anyone into following you. Thank you that you are honest, and faithful, and trustworthy. And that you are clear that there is a cost to being your disciple. But thank you too that whatever is given up, so much more is gained and that there is such blessing in this life and the next for all who follow you. Lord, please show us those areas where you are not first in our heart right now. Please help us to repent and to change so that we may follow you whatever the future holds until that day when we stand with joy before your throne. And we ask that for your name's sake.